Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and this is my video blog. So, I'm a little bit late in publishing this because I was at a friend's birthday party, and and I forgot to uh, record this before I left. Um, but I guess on the upsides, uh, unlike uh, previous editions, I don't really need to cover things that happen on Friday after I did the last recording. Well, I mean, except for last Friday. Anyhow. So I went to Nexus last week, which was a lot of fun. Um, Nexus is the Northeast uh, um, Conference on Science and Skepticism. And I went there two years ago. I missed last year because I was unemployed and di didn't want to spend money on the tickets. Uh, this year, I bought the tickets while I was still employed and then uh, became unemployed uh, after, uh, uh, after buying the tickets. So I went. Um, it was a two-day conference. It was held in the Art Inst Institute of technology. Um, I've covered, I've, I've written about this a, a lot on my Google Plus stream, or at least uh, a, a more detailed investigation, or, or a more survey type uh, look over of the schedule of the conference. I did want to touch a little bit more on an issue that was brought up in, in, uh, in a panel discussion that was done on uh, GMO foods. Largely, because, and I'm, I'm hoping to do this from a different angle than I have in the summaries. Uh, and so the, the panel discussion, it didn't go as well as I thought it did, partly because I don't think either of the participants were the best people that they could have gotten for that type of panel. Uh, but the audience was also pretty grumbly uh, pro-GMO. And I can understand why they are, although I think that it's sloppy of them to be, and that there's a lot of worry that uh, when people uh, might be opposing science for bad reason, or, or there's this idea that there are a lot of people opposing science for bad reasons, and people are, but that tends to lead people to snap judgments as to what the pro-science side of an issue is. And that's what I felt the Nexus community had done. And it's understandable, but it's unfortunate. Primarily because with, when it comes to GMO food, I so the actual stances taken were more, are we, are we ready at this point with the amount of testing we've done now to see broad use of GMO foods and should people be, uh, and, and should those foods be labeled in Western societies? That, that, uh, and the answers to that, yes or no, are quite different from potential other ways to look at GMO issues, different questions like, should GMO be allowed at all? Is GMO good or evil? Things like that, uh, or good or bad. Uh, and I think a lot of people were mistaking what was being discussed for, uh, they, they were mistaking the question that, that was being asked. And so the, the person who was theoretically anti-GMO wasn't actually strongly anti-GMO. He wanted GMO foods labeled. He wanted to have a lot more testing. And he was wary of them to a certain extent. Uh, and the person who was pro-GMO was much less wary in suggesting that we should see very, uh, very wide adoption, perhaps universal adoption, of GMO technologies. Uh, I might be exaggerating there a little bit, but I'm not sure. Um, and I actually found myself leaning a little bit more towards the GMO nervous uh, side there. I'm, I'm not going to call it an anti-GMO side. And instead of talking more about how the debate went, I'd rather just talk about what I think about GMOs. And I should preface this by saying that I, I'm an academe. I've, I've spent about 10 years working for a university after after getting uh, my degree. Uh, I was research staff. I did uh, scientific research as well as computer science research. Um, I studied neuroscience. Uh, and over the course of my life, I've tried to, to stay reasonably current on the sciences. I'm by no means a specialist in, um, in either ecology or genetics, although genetics is, a, is an area which I've taken a particular interest in and in which I've made more of an interest than, than 
probably average when it comes to scientific fields that I try to stay versed in. Um, of course, read Silent Spring and its sequel and read a number of the other well-regarded works in that field. I like biology, all of that, but there are specialists who you might find who certainly know more about me than this. There are a lot of people who you'll, you'll find who know a lot less about me than this, but that's basically where I stand. Uh, and as, as always, take this with a grain of salt. Try to seek the facts by reading relevant journals, talking with experts in these fields. Um, I'm not going to just say reach your own conclusion based on your feelings, because that's bloody stupid. And if you do that, you're an idiot and your opinion doesn't mean anything. But if you do attempt to stay versed in the field, and if you stay, if you have conversations with people who are versed, um, if you try to really value the sciences and read journals, things of that sort. Uh, and if, if whenever a scientific consensus ar uh, arrives around a well-defined issue, you follow it, then I think you're entitled to a certain amount of opinion on the matter. And the more effort you put into that, the more your opinion will mean. Um, so I don't have, uh, I, I personally am not worried uh, about about eating GMO foods. I'm willing to trust. I'm not absolutely certain that GMO foods don't have some unusual interactions with, uh, with the human body that in the course of digestion, uh, some, uh, some of the enzymes that might be present in such foods might have unusual interactions with the human body. I don't know that for sure, but I'm, I'm willing enough to take a risk on it. Just as part of life, we accept a lot of risks. It's just whenever we step outside our house, we something could fall out of the, out of the sky and smush us. Or our house could fall down and smush us, whatever. Um, I'm willing to take that risk. I'm not willing to, to make a super strong bet that there's zero, uh, that there's zero risk there. And I can understand why people would uh, take a different, uh, ha have a different risk assessment there. Um, I would, at this point, say maybe it's a little bit of an unusual position to think that there's enough risk to really be worth worrying about given the studies, but uh, I think there's there's a lot of room, uh, wiggle room, and it is still a relatively young field. Ooh, still too hot to drink. Um, when it comes to GMO crops and the environment, that's where I get a little bit more nervous. Um, and that once, once the food is dead and it's delivered to your plate, it, it, its genetics don't matter too much because it's not alive anymore. Any enzymes that are present in it, we can probably go looking for them inside it, see if they're, see if they're different, any structures, any chemicals we can relatively, I mean, I, I think we can have at least reasonable confidence, uh, about what the interactions with the body will be for any given crop once it reaches the plate. I'm more worried about GMO crops in the field. Um, I'm worried that they're genetic neighbors. That is, so, so the thing about, uh, about genes, genes are data. And the, the way that, uh, that evolution happens is that random mutations alter the genetic code of, uh, of the organism it's, it produces different enzymes or it produces them at different times. Um, it develops subtly different structure that impacts, um, impa uh, impacts a number of things. Uh, that's not the best way to explain that, uh, but I'm not prepared to explain that more deeply at the moment. Um, so you, you have these permutations of, uh, of genes that are in an organism. And there are events that, uh, that can happen in the, uh, in the environment that lead to more random mutations. And what I would worry about in the environment is that, so the, the reason that, that we feel that existing, gene, uh, uh, existing uh, breeds of, of foods that aren't engineered are safe is it, it's largely that it stood the test of time. 
That is, it's existed in the wild for a long time. Uh, any of its nearby genetic permutations presumably have been plumbed to a certain extent. Uh, any disease interactions, uh, it's just we know that nature has tested these for a long time. Humans have tested these for at least some time. Uh, we know what what uh, any given organism and its close genetic relatives are going to look like, uh, how they're going to interact with the environment, what their varieties are going to look like. Torts! Tort Feaser, get over here! Come here! Uh, anyhow, yeah, my cat is... Oh, well, one of my cats is... Uh, um, yeah, so we know we know what that's going to look like in the wild. We reasonably know what its interactions are going to look like with the human body. Uh, we we understand it on a better level than just the individual crop that's reached our plate. And that depth of experience and that amount of testing by nature is valuable. Um, and the problem with uh, and, and even with artificial selection, we st uh, that is selective breeding, things of that sort, we still have some amount of that testing, or at least we should. Um, if, if we're doing uh, certain types of experiments, like with the, uh, with the uh, domesticated silver fox, um, which was a Soviet breeding program, really fascinating. I don't remember if I've talked about it on this or not, uh, on, on my video blog or not. Um, but they, they used artificial selection on, on a type of, I think, gray fox in the Soviet Union. And over the course of something like uh, 10 or 20 generations, they managed to produce the kind of neoteny that's, that dogs and cats have that makes them domestic to a certain extent, um, which is great. Uh, we, uh, it, it's a successful experiment that demonstrates the effect of natural selection over a certain amount of time. The, the domesticated uh, um, silver fox, it exhibits characteristics that are similar to juvenile silver foxes. Uh, it never develops the adult aggression, um, plus there are other effects. It, it's, it's more friendly to, uh, to humans throughout its life. Cool. But with such a pronounced effect created over such a short period of time, I would be a little bit nervous about how domesticated those silver foxes actually are. And I think that we would be right to be because it's a, a fragile and and relatively it's a relatively new effect. And I think that we should be nervous in the same way about um, about things about either like short time period artificial selection on food or on direct genetic manipulation on food because we might not fully understand the depth uh, or the uh, uh, the level to which these traits breed true, even if we've engineered them, the, map, the, the fact is that there are, um, there are logistics evolved in genetics. There are mechanisms involved in genetics that we're still figuring out. And so having a longer testing period to me makes a lot of sense. And so either for individual safety or, uh, I mean, as, as I said, I'm willing to take the risk on individual safety, given the current amount of testing that, that we've done so far. I might be sticking my neck out there. I don't think I am, but, uh, but essentially I'm, I'm more or less neutral on, on nervousness there. But, but in particular, when these things are in the wild, um, I would prefer to have a long period of testing on improved foods. And I realize that there's an argument to be made given how much engineering we've actually done on some of these foods. Uh, golden rice is a highly improved, uh, apparently, um, version of rice that uh, provides a lot of essential nutrients that aren't normally present in rice, and it's being used to um, help in, in areas uh, where humans are suffering famine. And in that case, I'm actually, 
maybe maybe given necessity more willing to have those things go out into the wild but i'm still nervous about it because once you release an organism into the wild it's sometimes difficult to recall it uh even if you stick in um stick in kill switches on how long it's uh how many generations it's able to breed i would worry that those mechanism uh, mechanisms might fail and all it would uh, have to take would be for it to fail in a resilient way uh, for that mechanism to fail in a resilient way for suddenly the engineered organism to uh to spread all over uh spread all over and replace other crops so i'm uh so i'm i'm understanding of the nervousness uh, about gmos once once we've uh, I mean, I, I would be willing uh, to be convinced that this level of testing is not necessary. Um, it probably would take a few conversations with somebody who I really think is expert enough in this, and they might be able to convince me. Um, I would, I still, at, at least at this point, I, I would prefer to have more testing before we, before we're releasing things into the uh, into the wild, generally. So that's that's why I think I, I was more or less comfortable with the with the GMO nervous uh, position, and that the the pro GMO person seemed to be uh, seemed to be arguing that because we can analyze what's actually present in uh, in some of the uh, harvested uh, crops that have breached a plate, that we're safe. And I'm I, I'm not convinced that that that's good enough. Anyhow. That was Nexus. Uh, I was socially exhausted after um, uh, after Nexus. I, I was going to go to a Cosmos viewing party uh, on the uh, Sunday. Uh, uh, that was the second day of the conference. That is after the conference, but I was just uh, really tired. Uh, not tired, just exhausted of being around people. I'm an introverted person. I need to recharge after being around people for too long or too intensely. And it's not really just being around people, it's interacting with people in more than a, uh, more than, more than a trivial way. And to a certain extent, it's interacting with them at all. But afterwards, I, I went down to Union Square, I grabbed food at the Whole Foods there and just kind of sat in the park and relaxed and I felt better. Uh, so it was just... It was just being in an environment where uh, there were people around who I knew who I might be interacting with that, that was tiring. Um, on Monday, I went to an event for supporters of the uh, Secular Student Alliance, which is a group that I really believe is it's doing good. It's uh, forming student groups in uh, high schools and universities all over the country for people who are not religious and are promoting a secular science-based worldview. And I think that's important both because our society needs more of that worldview and because people who are inclined towards that probably could use some emotional support in, uh, in a world that's often not particularly friendly to those perspectives. Um, so I, I support them. I think they're a great organization. They also run something called Camp Quest, which uh, is a it's a summer camp for uh, for I think uh, high school, maybe middle school uh, kids who are inclined that way. Anyhow, really good organization. If you want to know of a good secular organization to support for kids, uh, that's one of them. And in my opinion, it's it's one of the best organizations uh, for that. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, I I had a bit of a migraine when I woke up, but it, it got better uh, before I had to leave. I was hanging out with uh, with someone from out of town who's a friend of a friend, uh, and we were going to go to a museum, but we ended up going instead. Uh, I ended up showing him uh, Tea Lounge, which is a coffee shop that I like in uh, Brooklyn. Although more on that later. So on Thursday, uh, on Wednesday, 
I don't think I did very much. I don't remember what I did on Wednesday. On Thursday, I went to the Brooklyn Museum to see a uh, an exhibit uh, by uh, Ai Weiwei. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right, but he's a Chinese uh, artist and, and activist. Uh, he uh, advocates for openness in society and uh, does a lot of conceptual art. Um, a few really neat pieces in that. Um, but mostly his, his type of art, it's more, it's more interesting because of the concepts and the story behind each piece of art than the art itself. It's definitely not high art. Sometimes it's visually interesting anyhow, but it's more of the type of art where if you told somebody the idea, they could probably uh, build an acceptable uh, piece of art that, ex that um, expressed the idea just as well. But that doesn't mean it's, it's bad art, and I, I really enjoyed it. It was a neat exhibit. Um, the uh, Brooklyn Museum uh, generally does a very good job of bringing interesting uh, people in. It, it, the Brooklyn Museum kind of focuses a little bit more on activism than it does on classical art, which is fine. Um, it's not my favorite uh, museum in New York City, but it is a museum that I like, and I'm happy to be a member. Um, after that, I swung by the tea lounge uh, and actually had a really bad experience there. So right now they're doing uh, an experiment where they turn off the internet uh, from 8.30 to 10.30 uh, p.m., which is normally when they have bands or comedians play. And a lot of people are very, a lot of regulars in particular are very upset about this because we often come there precisely, uh, we come there to do work, we come there to just browse on the internet to, uh, for a lot of reasons, but we're not usually there for the live events. And it's a big venue. It's not, uh, it's not like the live events normally fill up the place. Uh, and so a lot of us are upset that this week, at least, they're doing this experiment. And uh, I think it's that the bar, uh, the, some, some of the bartenders wanted to do this because they, I think they probably get a cut from from the funds that go to the band, and they wanted to uh, to see if people would pay more attention to the music, uh, so that they would have some more money to bring home or something like that. Uh, understandable, but absolutely infuriating. So I actually ended up kind of stomping out of there um, uh, when I found out that uh, when they cut the internet off, and I'm probably not going to go back if they keep doing that. But we'll have to see. I, I, I'm guessing that this is a week-long experiment, and we'll have to we'll have to see if they're if they're going to keep uh, with it or not. If they are, then I'll just have to find a different coffee shop, and probably never go back. Uh, if if they're not, then I'll be happy to return. Um, it's a comfortable place. Uh, good place to meet people. Good place to get tea. Decent food. It's nice and big. Uh, it's just when they do things like this. Uh, I mean, they, they've made a few other mistakes I find really irritating before. They got gigantic TVs and hung them over the bar, which kind of gave it a sports bar feel. But fortunately, nowadays, they leave the TVs mostly off because it was a dumb experiment, and nobody really liked it off. Uh, tonight, I, um, I went and helped celebrate a, a friend's birthday. Uh, I went to an event called Nerd Night, which uh, opened with, uh, with trivia and, uh, and then had three, three separate lectures. The trivia w uh, was kind of fun. Um, it, was, it was neat hanging out with, with a friend and some of his other friends. Most of them are, are dancers, though, and I find, I, I don't know, the community uh, is a little bit weird. But um, Uh, so the three lectures, what were they on? The first one was on uh, brewing whiskey, I think, uh, and the whiskey brewing uh, tradition in, in New York State, which was, uh, was kind of neat. Um, the second was on uh, scientific advances around Shakespeare's time and whether we saw Shakespeare, um, whether we shot, saw uh, Shakespeare weave any of these new scientific themes into his works. And I thought this was, this was particularly interesting. It's often hard to see 
when you're talking about events that happened so long in the past, it's hard to really know, uh, to keep track of what developments happened at the same time as each other and what influenced what. And this was a little bit helpful uh, along those lines, although, although the connections made were a little bit weak. Um, and uh, fortunately, I was kind of, uh, kind of tired uh, by this point, having been sitting still for so long, so I nodded off for a little bit of this presentation. Um, the, uh, the third presentation was about uh, obesity and the health risks that it has and why we have it and, uh, or, and why, or why it's a growing problem in, in Western countries and in general in, in the world. No, that was neat, and it's it's always nice to hear people uh, work not speaking on the topic who aren't social justice uh, um, activists, who I generally, as you might or might not know, don't tend to get along with even even when I like their causes, and often I don't. Uh, I tend to find social justice uh, activists to be highly obnoxious people who like to lecture you about how their perspective is right and how if you were only more educated you would adopt it or how you're a, a really bad person for not buying into whatever weird worldview they have. Um, I mean, occasionally they, they end up being accidentally useful, but in general, even for causes I care about, like uh, gender role abolitionism, uh, gay rights, things like that, I think that, that many of the activists are far more harmful than they're helpful. And I generally think good, good activism is about being reasonably near the mainstream and just continually tugging it in the right direction until it's moved enough that you can live a reasonable life. It, it doesn't necessarily mean being validated, being celebrated, but it means being able to live, as I said, a reasonable life. That's it. And I think things, things like uh, like gay rights, that's generally, that should be the main focus in, in gay rights, uh, in the gay rights movement. Um, gay marriage, good to celebrate. Doesn't mean that you're a bad person for not, uh, for not supporting it, but I, I, I do want to, uh, want to push for it, but it's, it's something that I, that I push softly, uh, for. I'll, I'll make arguments that are perfectly understandable to mainstream people, uh, that are about, People who are mainstream but not straight, and it's it's about paving that path. Well, of course, you need to get the basics done first, like making sure that I, uh, like there are some nations where doing non non heterosexual sexual acts uh, can land you in jail, and obviously that needs to stop. Or talking about how it's okay to be gay might land you in jail. That also needs to stop. There's not a lot of wiggle room there. But when it comes to things much further along, on, uh, when it comes to comfort for minorities of, of various kinds, you don't have to argue as hard for that. You don't need to shun people or make them feel like they're bad people. Just use mainstream arguments. You'll make uh, the best type of progress that way. Anyhow, <clears throat> yeah, uh, uh, and, and I guess the, the thing is, uh, when it comes to obesity, there are some some fat acceptance movement types who think it's it's fine to be fat, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, yada yada. And I just think they're wrong. It, it doesn't mean that people should be mean to fat people, that they sh uh, that fat people shouldn't be hired or that uh, or anything like that. But being fat is an undesirable state of being. It's not a good thing. It's not healthy. It's not attractive. Um, and in general, you should try and eat and exercise and otherwise arrange your life so that you're not fat. And I'm not perfect on this front myself. I, I currently weigh, uh, on average about 210 pounds. I would like to be around 180 pounds. When I look down at my belly, it's not the shape that it should be in. It's not particularly attractive shape. Could be a lot worse, but I have a lot of room for improvement there, and so far I'm not doing particularly well at fixing my diet and getting the exercise I need to avoid that. 
but I'm working on that. Again, because I would like to be more attractive. Uh, I would like to be healthier. And fixing my diet and my exercise levels are the right way to do that. But I'd, I'd also like for the rest of society to be healthier and more attractive and, and so on. I mean, you can't fix everybody's attractiveness, but I don't think anybody particularly likes looking at a gigantic uh, person. Well, some people do. And if they do, more power to them. But I'm comfortable with my aesthetic preferences. I'm comfortable talking about them. And I'm not going to call things attractive uh, or pretend that I, I find things unrepugnant uh, when that's not the way I feel. Anyhow, uh, so that's been the last week. Uh, tomorrow, um, I'm going to a New York City Parks archery program, which is kind of exciting. I, so the New York City uh, Department of Parks, they have some programs where, uh, where they, they have a certain number of slots for you to learn, learn something. And for next weekend, they have an archery program. I entered uh, a... Uh, an online drawing? I don't, I, I don't know. There, there wasn't any charge to enter it, but I, I put my name in the hat and they contacted me. So I need to find my way to Staten Island tomorrow, uh, to a, a particular park in the middle of Staten Island to go learn to arch. Or to, I guess one could say, I don't know if one can say that, to, to learn some archery. And that's going to be fun. I don't know how long uh, I'm going to get to do it. I don't know how many people are going to be there. Uh, hopefully I won't injure myself in some hilarious way, um, or not so hilarious way, but it'll be, uh, it'll be neat. And also, I haven't been to Staten Island very much since moving to New York, and occasionally I think about heading back there, and it, it, it's good to have another excuse to head to the island. And, uh... Let's see, what else has been going on? Um, well, I have a, a Taurus. Taurus, get away from her! Yeah, my, my male cat sometimes uh, harasses my female cat. Um, let's get him up here. Oh, who's a big boy? Um, I'm still, I'm not making a lot of progress on learning to knit. I just need to find a group that will help walk me through some of the early stages so that I can really get the hang of this. Um, I just, I think part of it is for knitting, it's one of those things where I'm not as much of a self-starter as I am on other things. Like when it comes to programming, I'm learning uh, Scala right now. I'm, I, I've been writing a few small test programs. Uh, I'm going to try to start writing some bigger stuff soon. But I'm just getting the hang of the language. Um, but it, it's, just, it's a lot easier to do that, um, to just sit down and uh, kind of veg out and uh, have some tea and sit at the computer and, and do that kind of thing than it is to learn a complicated set of physical motions, um, like knitting. So, yeah, I, I just need to find a group for knitting. Um, the Scala stuff is, is going okay, and it does seem to be a decent language. Uh, I'm not, I'm still much, I'm still more fond of, of C and Perl, and to a certain extent Java. Uh, I'm not yet seeing the point of Scala, although I suspect I will at some point. I mean, so many people have recommended it uh, highly to me as a way to write really nicely scalable multi-threaded uh, software and and so uh, there's got to be something to it that's that's cool um, but I'm just I'm not seeing what that is yet maybe when I do see what it is I'll, I'll start uh, preparing teaching materials uh, for it um, Yeah, I think that's that's probably it. Uh, if 
incidentally, if there are some topics that you would like to see, uh, uh, that, that you would like to choose for, for me to talk about, submit them in a comment uh, and I'll, uh, I'll look over them. And if, if I find them interesting, uh, I'll, I'll consider working them into the next video. Uh, until then, I guess uh, that's it. Bye.